critics who want to discredit the existence of an omnipotent God try to imagine things that God isn't able to do. The problem is they misunderstand and misstate what's meant by the word omnipotence. Uh, what the critics are really doing is drawing up things that would be self-contradictory. I know some people like to bring up that old question, could God make a rock so big that he couldn't move it? Well, setting aside for a moment the more important theological and philosophical issue, let's just try to understand the question itself. Motion is when an object changes from being at point A to being at point B. If the universe is finite and a rock was made so large that it filled the entire universe, there'd be no place into which to move the rock. There's no point B. And so the question itself is a self-contradiction. Even if space was infinite and the imagined rock filled all space so that it was infinite too, moving it would still have no real meaning. However, if we put a point somewhere inside that infinitely large rock and made some frame of reference around it, then we slowly slid that point around inside that frame of reference. If you were an observer standing on that moving point, the rock would appear to be moving around you. So it depends on how we define moving. Inside the rock so big that can't be moved, there could be a moving point. And relative to that point inside the rock, the rock could be said to be moving. And we still say things like we watch the sun rise in the morning and move across the sky till dawn. But it's really us on the earth that's moving. It's not the sun at all. And yet we could say that the sun moved. It's just the way in which we look at things like that. Uh, the, the whole rock moving paradox is really just an absurd word game. Uh, it makes assumptions which are totally contrary to the observed nature of the universe itself. Uh, there's no such rock. Uh, the whole thing is just a dreamed up hypothetical. And it hypothetically assumes that the universe exists as a thing in and of itself with no design, no created purpose. Uh, what's even more important is that the critics have a very naive and frankly wrong understanding of what we mean by the word omnipotence. The real issue has to do with properly understanding what we mean by that term omnipotent as it relates to God. It doesn't mean that God is able to do anything a person imagines. Let's take a look at the meaning of that word for a moment. The Bible clearly states, for example, that God can't lie. It says that directly in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. And then in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, it tells us that it's impossible for him to approve of unrighteousness. It would be absurd to imagine God doing something contrary to what he wants to do, or that he would frustrate his other attributes, or contradict his own nature. The theological term omnipotent refers to God's ability to do all his holy will. There's nothing he desires to do that he can't do. Now, in Matthew 19, verse 26, it says, With God all things are possible. This is where the critic picks up his little criticism. But we have to consider the context here and see just what's being talked about. We need to identify the things that are being spoken of here by the Lord when he says this. Does Jesus mean that God can sin? That God can become evil or wish himself out of existence or make self-contradictory objects? Of course not. Jesus was answering the question, who then can be saved? The issue had to do with being qualified to enter into the kingdom of God. That's what verses 20 through 25 were talking about in that very chapter. God made us and reveals that no morally guilty person can enter where his kingship is most openly revealed. Fallen humans simply aren't able to qualify themselves. They can't get over that sin barrier that we've had since our fall in Eden. That removal of the barrier, that being able to get into God's kingdom again, uh, can only happen when the guilt is removed by the provisions made by God. And if a person's guilt isn't paid for by the Savior on the cross, there's nothing that can get him into God's kingdom. With men, it's impossible. And so Jesus said that very thing. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Referring, of course, to the idea that God can do anything he wants to do.
Now, that's directly stated in Scripture. Everything that God desires not only can, but will take place. Let's look back at those verses again for a minute. In Psalm 135, verse 6, it says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in earth. And then in Nahum 1.3, it says, Jehovah doeth His will in the whirlwind and in the storm. Now, <clears throat> we could ask the question, can God do everything we can imagine? No, He can't. The Bible never says He could. It clearly states some things He can't do. And that's part of what makes Him God. Is we're glad He can't do those things. But can God do everything He purposes and desires to do? And there the answer is yes. He absolutely can and does. So what about this verse that the critics uh, smugly point out in Judges 1.19? Let's take a look at that verse for a minute. Uh, the verse says, And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. Now, one critic wrote this, and I, I quote him. He said, This is remarkable on its own, revealing a far from omnipotent tribal God being defeated by technology. But, we answer the critic, was it God or Israel who couldn't drive out the chariots of iron in Judges 1.19? The verb structure here in Hebrew for drive out is what we call an infinitive construct. Now, infinitives don't include a subject. It never said he. That word is not there. It's inserted by translators. That's where the pronouns often come from when Hebrew is translated into English. It would be perfectly correct to translate it, they, meaning Judah, could not drive out the inhabitants. In fact, that's the way it's translated in many versions newer than the old King James Version of 1611. The new King James Version carefully translates it that way uh, using the, the second option, uh, which actually isn't secondary. It's just a, another way of understanding this infinitive construct and would have come quickly to the minds of those hearing these words and reading them in the book of Judges. It says that uh, in, in the dictionaries and grammar books that explain these Hebrew constructions, uh, that we have to look at the context to see what the infinitive construct is referring to. So uh, what we have here is two different situations, two separate battles being described. To know who's doing the driving out, we have to look at the context. When Judah went against those in the mountains, they prevailed because the Lord was with them. However, when they went on their campaign against the inhabitants of the lowlands, they failed. They feared the chariots. The Lord was not behind them because of their fear of those iron chariots. They failed to rely on his power as they did the mountain campaign. Now, in Psalm 20, verse 7, Jesus reminded God's people, that they needed to trust in God's power and not fear human armies. The one brings victory and the other brings defeat. That verse in Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, uh, that helps us to understand the main point that's being made here. These two very different situations don't show a limit upon God. They show our limits when we fail to trust God. So the criticism does show uh, a limit, but it's a limit in the study made by the critics who are so driven by their assumptions about the Bible that they fail to see what's really being talked about in these verses. So can God do anything we can imagine? No, he can't. But can he do and does he do all his holy will? He absolutely does. He always does. He always will.